Hey, this is Man Made Mead. Welcome back to What's New with Mead, episode number five. Um, today, we are going to be discussing kind of the major topic of um, using wood or oaking your um, meads or your wines or your beers and kind of the uh, different variations you can go through to oak your stuff. We are also going to uh, briefly discuss kind of like other flavors, like what happens when you impart or when you put like a pepper in, like how do you do it in its best manner, um, just kind of that, that various topic. So uh, I'm glad you're here. If you're watching this on YouTube um, or if you're just listening on the uh, podcast apps, you can find this Spotify and Apple Music or sorry, Apple Podcast, a bunch of various places. Regardless, I'm glad to have you here. Um, it's going to be probably not a very long episode, but uh, nonetheless, I'm still excited. So let's first get started uh, by talking about what I'm drinking tonight. I have here, this is one of my older meads in life. This is a um, mango mead, my very first mango mead that I ever made. You can kind of see it if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it at least. It's pretty clear. It's got a nice, pretty uh, amber-esque color, um, very like, you know, honey colored in general. This one was something I did three years ago now, two and a half years ago now. It was one of my first ones. And um, he used mango puree, a traditional mead, let it sit for a long time. Turned out pretty good. So I'm sipping on that. I think the really nice thing about it, it's very dry, but the really nice thing is like on the smell of it, um, as mead ages, the um, honey character always like matures, of course, but pops out more in my opinion. So I, uh, I really like that. It's really nice. So uh, that's what I'm drinking. I'm going to be sipping on this tonight. And um, it's not like I had another one I could have picked. I uh, thought about picking that was something that I had, I had actually... Um, oaked, but I decided against it because I had this bottle open. Um, I took it over to friends and so I was like, you know what, let's go ahead and keep sipping on it. So that's what I'm drinking. Maybe you're drinking something along with me, who knows, but regardless, um, it's pretty good. So now, um, that was segment one. What am I drinking? Segment two, part two. Um, I want to talk to you about like the process of oaking uh, your mead. So what this means meads, what this means, oh good lord, um, is you're taking like oak chips, oak spirals, oak cubes, oak anything like that, and you are putting it onto your mead in, um, in an aging part of the mead's life. Um, often, you, you really choose to do that side more. You don't want to um, really put wood in during fermentation all the time. Some people do and it works really well, but a lot of the times we use it in aging. So after fermentation, um, it's aged on wood. So uh, you can put, like I said, oak chips, which is basically just like ground up um, into you know tinier pieces, oak wood. And that stuff works really well. I've used that for um, a couple wines that I've used. A lot of times in, in wine packs um, you might buy, you might have some oak um, chips in that. You can also buy them at homebrew shops. Those things work really well too. They diffuse really well within the um, the alcohol and so I've had a lot of success with that. You can use oak cubes which are literally little cubes of oak. They work really well as uh, as well. They are a little easier to get off of like when you're racking because they're bigger. So like if you're auto siphoning sometimes the oak chips if they're small enough can get um, back into the, the wine or beer or mead, whatever you're making. So I often, uh, I would go with oak cubes in those two. The other ones you can use, you can use things called like oak spirals. So oak spirals are exactly what they sound like. They are like uh, little, uh, I would, I kind of compare them to like giant burritos of, of uh, oak or wood. Now I'm using the word oak a lot. What I really mean is any wood. Um, the oak spirals or wood spirals in, in general are just another way to diffuse your or to put that flavor into your um, mead. A lot of companies are doing these these oak spirals now. They are, are, are making them. There's a bunch of different variations of wood. You don't have to use oak necessarily. A lot of people do, but you can use any other kind of uh, wood. Each wood has its different flavor. And if you know, you've tried a lot of wines, you might have experienced the different varieties of um, wood 
flavors in in wine or mead even because wood is its own like living creature it does put off its own own tannic uh, properties and flavors and so that's why like sometimes big time or a lot of really good whiskeys or spirits are aged in like multiple different barrels different kinds of barrels um and they they of course are also aged in like uh they can be aged in in different alcohol barrels in general but what i'm mainly speaking to is the idea that your wood makes a huge difference on the mead what do you expect when you put oak cubes or oak chips or spirals into a mead well you're going to change the mouthfeel of the mead mouthfeel is exactly what that sounds like too it is when you drink that how does how um how heavy, how light does that alcohol feel in your mouth? Does it feel thicker? Does it feel thin? Does it have um, these like tannins, which are generally accompanied to um, maybe somewhat of a puckering uh, feeling in your mouth? Like how does it affect that feel in your mouth? A really oaked Wine has its has a very tannic mouthfeel, and I equate it, like I just said, to that uh, that feeling of, um, you know, dr- not necessarily dryness. That's not a good way to put it. A lot of really dry wines are tannic, though. Hmm. Anyways, uh, it, it the wood changes the flavor, and you can use that to your advantage. You can take a an average mead. You can throw some oak spirals cubes chips anything in it and give it some extra uh, dimension a part of mead making is having a multi-dimensional tasting mead meaning you're going past just something that's sweet maybe you want something that's sweet that has a uh, that's very aromatic and that has a a good mouth feel so you want to hit all these parameters in order to make your best meads and um, it's something that takes some time to figure out because, quite frankly, uh, it is also up to personal opinion. Some people like a very tannic tasting, feeling mead. Some people like a sweeter mead. All of those things are just varieties in, in which that you have to decide on your own. And I'll, I think I said it last episode, maybe. Um, you, uh, you need to be making meads for like your own sake because at the end of the day you're probably going to be the one drinking the most, and then there will be people that like your meads. Um, But don't just make meads to try and appease other people. That's my opinion, at least. So uh, the three different options, there's even more options. If you have the luxury of um, barrel aging your, your meads, which is literally what it sounds like, you take a barrel, you take a wood barrel, sometimes they are um, have been used. It could be a fresh barrel, charred, all those things. Um, and you put your alcohol in that, and you let it sit for X amount of time, and it changes the flavor. That stuff's really cool too. I've actually never done it. I've tasted plenty of things that have been barrel aged, and every one of them I've had is fantastic. I would love to be able to do it. Part of the problem is, um, unless you're making giant like quantities of certain alcohols, like you're not going to get a barrel that is five gallons very often. You can, but it's just harder to do. So they, they often sell them from like distilleries and other places um, in like 55 gallon barrels. So I'm not exactly at that point in life where I'm making 55 gallons of mead at a time. And I don't really want to age with a bunch of oxygen on top because as we know, oxygen and alcohol don't mix. So uh, I haven't done that. I've I know they sell, I've seen them on Amazon, I've seen them in some other places, like little two-gallon barrels or one-gallon barrels that are like minis, and I haven't aged anything in one of those before, frankly, because I feel like it's too small. But it's the same process as oaking or, um, you know, using chips or spirals or cubes. The only difference is that you just have it all in one area. You're not like putting extra wood in there. And that works too. So here's kind of the pros and cons of that. The barrel side, it probably takes up more room. Um, Also, you can only get a couple uses out of those barrels because eventually the flavors from 
the mead you're making soak into that wood and after you've done that two or three times you don't really want to reuse that that's why a lot of distilleries get rid of their barrels after a couple uses is because they're kind of spent the wood flavor is not necessarily there anymore um, so that's kind of a con of using the barrel um, a pro is that i think it's a faster way to get your flavoring and um, oftentimes you can get like really nice style woods kinds of woods that are charred and give special flavors. So that's that's kind of a really a nice part of it. Uh, a pro of using the like wood chips or cubes or, or spirals is that you are able to, in a lot of ways, control more, more so control how much flavor impartation you have for those woods. Because you are literally putting those things into there and then you're taste testing as often as you want, and then you can pull it off. You can do the same thing with a barrel, but I think if you find out your uh, quantities you want for your woods, you can repeat that pretty easily, and you can uh, always buy more oak cubes or chips or whatever you're using. So that's that's kind of a nice thing. the The con to it is that you are uh, you have to rack off of them, and if it's like really small things like the oak chips, you might be racking those things over into your next container. So again, pros and cons. Uh, I've used oak cubes before. I have actually um, whiskey soaked some oak cubes and used them in a uh, mead before, and that was fantastic. I've used an oak spiral, and that thing was really great too. Um, I've also, let's see, I used yeah, the oak chips before in a wine. That stuff was, that was really nice, and I... I just haven't had a mead recently that has been like needing of um, an oak flavor, an oak undertone or overtone. So uh, I've been making more fruity things and I feel like a pineapple mead that is like oaked doesn't work to me. So stuff like that doesn't work super well in my brain at least. So I haven't attempted it. Anyways, uh, the big thing is when you are putting your mead into a barrel or when you are putting oak whatever into your mead, you need to be tasting it fairly regularly. And that's because that impartation of the uh, the flavor might come really quickly. And you don't want to just put away that mead that you have put those that oak spiral in, um, put it away for like a year. Because you might wind up with a really, really strong tannic mead that just kind of ruins that flavor because you left it on too long. You can often look at the, especially oak spirals, the, um, it says like the, the flavor impartation, how long it takes for that flavor to be fully taken out of the spiral. Uh, and most of them are like five to six weeks. So you can guarantee depend on those things. Uh, the spirals are really nice in my opinion, because most of them, the companies I've seen and I've used are the little spirals, like they're like three or four inches tall and maybe an inch round. You put it into your mead and those are generally graded for like three gallons. So you do two of those, you can get six gallons. They're really not too expensive. You can get some nice different wood varieties um, on, on, you know, basically anywhere that sells them. And so that's, that's kind of unique. Uh, you still do need to taste test it over time. I am always doing that with all of my things that I put more flavoring in after because the flavorings change over time. And that's really important to know that you you might think that your oak flavor is not going to take very long to soak in, but it could very well take over that mead really quickly. And if you don't catch it quickly enough, you kind of can't take that flavor back. You can't pull that ingredient out of the mead anymore. It's just how it is. And tannic flavor stays over time, that's for sure. It's not one that fades. There are some other flavors that fade. The tannic wood flavor does not. So I have used <clears throat> some wood before. It's pretty good, and uh, I'll definitely be using more in the future. But this kind of segues into my next topic, which is, aside from wood, there's a bunch of other like flavors you can put in. Like For example, um, what if you wanted to put like a pepper, like a jalapeno, or a habanero, or... Um, anything like that into your mead. What you're going to find is that those same rules of like taste testing your mead apply to those things as well. And that's because the that impartation of uh, a pepper, let's say in particular, um, happens very quickly. 
So, for example, I've let's say I made a um, a one gallon traditional mead, and I wanted to uh, I wanted to add a jalapeno to that. I make my traditional mead, I let it ferment out, I rack it over into my new container. I still have a gallon of mead. That was fun. A gallon of mead, and um, then I take my one jalapeno and I de-seed it because if you've ever made anything with a pepper, like a meat with a pepper, the seeds are where all the heat comes from. So you can either keep them in uh, or take them out. I often keep take them out because you can still get the pepper flavor from the pepper. Uh, the seeds are just where the most potent heat is. You cut your pepper up. I take my seeds out. When you put that pepper in, you need to be taste testing it regularly because that will, especially peppers, will impart super quickly. It might only take a day or two for you to get that maximum flavor heat that you want from the mead. And that's such a short amount of time. It might take even less time than that. It just depends on how small your batch, how many peppers you've put in. All of those things really change and affect the ultimate result. The same thing goes for any other pepper, but also like dry hopping. I've dry hopped a mead before, which is where I literally just took and put in a like muslin bag my pellets or my... Uh, hops and then I put that into the mead and I had to taste test that thing regularly because hops also take a certain amount of time before they impart and it could be really short could be really quickly I caught my dry hopping experience like pretty quickly I, I realized oh this is this is happening fast because I I taste tested it before I put the hops in and then about I don't know like Two days later, I tried it and I was like, holy cow, this thing is really kicking. So I had to pull it off pretty quickly. And that's okay. You just have to really watch your flavors. Any any flavor additions in the post-fermentation um, process, you kind of have to watch out for. And that's just mead making. You get used to trying your stuff all the time. If you're not trying your stuff all the time, one, you're doing a disservice to yourself because you're not seeing how your own product is changing over time, which then you're not learning what flavors are changing. Because there are some things that we just can't figure out. Like I can sit here and, and tell you all of these things, but until you experience it, you might not fully agree, not might not fully understand. And that's, that's fair. That's understandable. But um, you just have to be on top of your game trying your own stuff. You also want to develop your palate. And for me, I really enjoy taste testing something and then hopefully over time seeing it get better. Because there are some meads that I've tried two weeks after it's been made, you know, even two months after it's been made, and gone, this is awful. So bad. And then I wait six months and I go, hey, it's getting better. Uh, get, a good example is my uh, experiment mead, which was a spearmint tea mead with um, spearmint tea bags and, of course, a traditional mead. Basically, that thing was so strong. In my face, the spearmint flavor, it was just, it was terrible truly terrible and um rather than dump it i put it back and i put it away for i've had it for like a year and a half now that thing is because of the age is getting so much better it's getting more mellow it's just turning into a great mead and that's because i let it age and i taste tested it you know a couple of months after i i put it away and then i kept doing that and just monitored its change so any flavor additions that you put into your meads, make sure you are on top of taste testing them. And um, it's not hard. Maybe you have some experience with this. So you have to let me know. But uh, there are lots of different, of course, flavors and, of course, recipes in the world. Um, I have found that anytime you use spices, anytime you use something that is not necessarily fruit-based, um, the flavor potency is, like, higher. I don't know if that's exactly true or makes sense. So I have had a lot of experience with this and I'm continuing to have experience. I will never claim that I know everything about this subject because truthfully, I don't think anybody does. We just, um, we're all learning from one another. So hopefully you've picked something up from that. And I, I find that, uh, I found it's important to learn from one another. So that was my main topic for today is talking about just adding flavors in the secondary. Like what are you getting out of woods, out of, peppers out of anything else uh, there are some wild meads out there so just go out and try to make your own thing and that's kind of what I do is I make my own meads and sometimes they're crazy meads sometimes they're normal but I'm learning from all my recipes so that's section two part two now uh, my last thing I always do with my um, my podcast is like on the uh, you know part three 
I always talk to you guys about some me mistakes or and like me successes that I've had recently. It's been a very, very wild two weeks um, for me, and it's still going to get even crazier because I just have so much going on. But like my biggest, my me mistake that I've made recently, um, I have been running this, this test with this yeast, um, like a bunch of different yeasts and doing a video on it. And I, I basically ended up adding yeast nutrient in to, uh, to one of them. And I did not have enough room for the, the foaming to occur and it, it blew up and I had to deal with a big old mess. So I, I just was being dumb. I didn't think about how much it would foam. So I would, my advice to you, encouragement is anytime you're adding yeast nutrient, it's for one, I tried to do it a quick way, and that's what got me in trouble. I tried to just put it into the bulk of everything, and it just blew up. What you really need to do is get a separate container out, um, like a little mason jar or a cup, put your yeast nutrient in that, put a little bit of meat on top of that, let that get all mixed up, and then put it into the rest of it. And it will foam less, which ultimately stresses the yeast out less. Because if you put all your ingredients in, or all your nu nutrient in, and they start foaming up, they're just freaking out so they have they get a little stressed out um but that's okay it just happens so this is my failure my um success recently is i uh i have been making um some more meads with of course amaretti flavoring and i think some of you guys have seen that hopefully but uh, i have found some really really good combinations of flavors that i like um and i i'm very very i don't want to spoil all of them i feel like that's uh, let's just say I've been playing. I've been playing around with like some of their vanilla bean flavoring, and that stuff's been really good. Um, I've also been playing around with like elderberry and some other stuff that is new to me. So that that's been a success for me. But overall, the big su success in my life is the the channel is growing, and I'm very very excited for that. We are about we're at nine thousand subscribers, almost to ten thousand. So I need your help continuing to grow the channel. I would uh, appreciate you guys helping me with that and hopefully telling other people about your mead making experience. One bit of news to share with you guys is that I will be, um, this next week over spring break, I will be going to mead con and this is my first year to ever do this. Um, I have decided it was something to be really fun to do. So I'll be going out there. I don't know if you're going to go to that, if anyone else is, but if you are look out for me, I'm going to learn a bunch about mead making. It's basically exactly what it sounds like mead con. It is a whole, it's a big educational moment for, for me. So, uh, hopefully I might, I might see you there. Let me know if you'll be there and it's in Colorado. So if you're local, um, and around Colorado, I might see you. So anyways, short episode this week. Um, again, been very busy and I apologize for a short one, but I'll be back in two weeks with another what's new with mead and another topic. I would like to start a new section where uh, I take questions from you guys. And the way you can contact me with your questions is to email me. If you will email me at, this is weird, but you got to email, I'll put it in the description of everything too, at meadmademan at gmail.com. Um, that will uh, actually help me, you know, get those messages. But send me a voice memo, send me a video or something. I would love to, again, start a section where I can play those things and, um, or ask me questions in general, I can play those things and you guys can be help, help be part of the podcast. If you have questions for me or just topics you want me to discuss, I would love, glad, you know, gladly bring those things up into the conversation, but go uh, check that out. That's in the description. Um, there's also a bunch of other links down below to all that stuff goes to support me. And, uh, if you are watching this on video, you are probably a Patreon or a patron member. So, uh, I'm switching now to, to change that. So, um, this is, I, the video portion, if you want to watch the video of this is on Patreon and that's patreon.com slash manmade meat. But thank you guys for watching. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Leave your uh, comments below. And uh, of course, you know, I hope that you will ask me some questions about me making and share your own experiences with your friends. So of course, with that,